let me <coughs> explain the, <coughs> the chart here a little bit this morning. The red line here covers all the people with white robes from back in the beginning of time, straight on through to where they're finally resurrected right here after Christ is on earth. And this is in Revelations 20, verses 1 through 15. Blessed is he that hath part in the first resurrection, for of such the second death hath no power. The black line <coughs> represents death from the killing of Abel straight on through until that which is in death is brought up at the great white throne judgment. The green line is representing time from the records of Genesis, from the Garden of Eden, right straight on through the millennium, right on out into the eternal age. <coughs> the blue line covers where the bride of Christ starts. During the dispensation of grace, they're clothed in fine linen. There's a lot of difference between fine linen and just white robes. A lot of people, I've even had a letter, but Brother Jackson explained to me. There's people you've got to go in actual detail before they see anything. And I just refuse to write an, a six or seven or eight page letter just to explain to somebody in detail just what it takes to open his eyes. Because all that Paul ever wrote, it's written right there. They've never found any extra letters that he sent to anybody personally to explain their inability. We've either got to have the Holy Ghost or we don't have it. For if the Holy Ghost is in us, he'll teach you all things. No matter how limited we are in our earthly education, the Holy Spirit sooner or later will take out of your mind of memory... And will digest it to us. So, from the advent of Christ, the crucifixion on the cross, and the upper room, and the descent of the Holy Spirit, the white robed saints started. And here's where they're raptured right here. That ends that white robed saints, and that is the fine linen saints. Now, it's absolutely true that through the age of grace, there's been many people that was just saved, they didn't get a chance to live very long before they were martyred. Now keep in mind, many people, thousands upon thousands of them, from here to here, they only got to live a few days confessing their sins and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and their life was snuffed out. Those people was never allowed to live long enough to prove whether they was a 30-fold, a 60, or a 100-fold. How many catch the point? First off, you've got to have the Holy Spirit or you're not going to bear fruit. Most of it's just going to be an expression of your natural nature. But I've read the Scriptures, in the, I mean not the Scriptures, but the histories. All through them early years of Rome, when they would come and arrest the Christians, one particular episode... Many Christians was in the arena, tied in bunches, ready for the wild animals to be turned loose, or they was tied as stakes, ready for the fires to be lit. When they lit the fires, the spectators in the bleachers, thousands of them, expecting to hear screams and begging, all they heard was from the lips of the saints, looking up, oh, thank you, Jesus. While the frames is leaping, they're praising the Lord. And they die in the flames. Conviction fell upon the multitudes. Out of the bleachers came these Roman pagans. And they saw something that they had never saw before in their life. And they run into the arena. I want to die like them. I want to die with them. I have to say, God is very gracious and merciful. Don't ever question God. Because the thief that hung on the cross with Jesus in 33 A.D., one criticized, if you were such and such and such and such and such, and you looked over at the other one, why don't you say something? And all that other one said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What was Jesus' words? This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. 
Now, paradise at that time was hell, another branch of it. Hell was divided in a place called paradise and torment. Therefore, the righteous, through time, they went into that place. Their spirits did not go to heaven. But David one day, he was inspired in the Psalms. And he said these words, Thou wilt not suffer or allow my soul to be in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. And yet he was there, but in paradise. But we know when Jesus died on the cross, where did he go? He went to hell. And he preached to the imprisoned spirits. And on the third day when he arose, he took all those righteous spirits out of paradise. The wicked was left there. It tells you in Matthew that when that great earthquake came that followed the resurrection of Christ, the graves was opened. And many of those that had risen appeared in the city as a vindication that hell has been conquered. Now then, it was the Paul, Apostle Paul years later when he wrote Ephesians 4 concerning the one that has ascended into heaven to be the high priest. He said, he's the one that descended first into the lower parts of the earth. And he led captivity captive. And he gave gifts unto men. Jesus was not in the upper room where the Holy Spirit fell, passing out tongues and prophecies and things. He's in heaven on the high, as a high priest, making intercession. But those that went to heaven with him went in glorified bodies. Now, we've got a lot of people who think, but, but they didn't all come forth. Now, Brother Jackson, go in detail. Now, tell me, how many do you really think that did come up? All of the righteous saints that was in paradise went up with him. What's the purpose of God taking a few and putting their bodies on them and leaving the rest of them there? So they were resurrected. That begins something to other. So when he took him to heaven... It took all those Old Testament saints and it took the thief with him. The other thief is still in hell. His body was never resurrected. So then from that day, martyrdom, persecution, ridicule, we come into the Spanish Inquisition. Spain butchered them, burnt them, slaughtered them. If you want to know how Spain, through that Spanish Inquisition, which lasted over a hundred years, pregnant Christian women took them and cut them open, took their infants out of their wombs, threw them to the hogs, desecrated them. Now the point is this. If they haven't been a believer very long, then don't tell me necessarily that they have learned how to really bear fruit. Keep in mind the parable Jesus said, and some will bear forth thirty, and some sixty and a hundred. Well, you've got to live a while to learn the grace of God. For we grow by grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, if somebody shoots you three days later, have you grown very much? But you're going to have a white robe. Yes, you will. But that still don't make you in the bride of Christ. So we've got to realize, brothers and sisters, God knew exactly by re election and predestination. He knew exactly how to preserve these bride saints all along. He also knew exactly, brothers and sisters, these that are absolutely not going to be in the bride... They're going to be in this line when they're died and martyred and crucified. That's the only way we can picture it. 
You've got to make every parable, every scripture, find its place. Then we can see this. I see a young soldier in World War II dying on the battlefield. He left home when he was 18 years of age. Mommy told him, son, don't forget God. He never even thought, thought that he would ever need God. But his body had been riddled in the battlefield. There he lays on the ground. And tears coming in his eyes. All he could say is, Mommy. Oh, God. Forgive me. Now, you can say, well, I don't believe in deathbed repentance. Well, what about the thief on the cross? Don't never question God. Leave some of those things up to Him. He runs his business the way he wants to. I'm not his secretary. And I'm not his bookkeeper. So, brothers and sisters, there's a lot of men died in battlefields all through the ages that came from Christian homes. Maybe the days of their life after they believed and repented. Maybe it didn't last long enough. For them to really grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. But it brought them to a place of repentance and saying, Jesus, forgive me. So then you put them in that line. Don't question God. The minute you do, you'll find yourself going backwards and wandering. Because you'll hit another scripture somewhere, and there you'll go on that. Then you hit another one. After a while, you're wandering in the jungle... A mental confusion, I don't understand. That's what it all comes to. <clears throat> so, we come right on through. World War II was fought. Here's where it ended. Look at this dashed line. Out of the effects of World War II, the old Roman beast, the ten hard system of Europe, began to rise out of the rubbish and the plunder of the situation that Europe has been left in. This nation pumped <coughs> foreign aid into that European continent to rebuild it, to reconstruct it. Canada and the United States kept air forces and troops there to guard against that Russian bear. They thought Russia is going to be the beast. When I came home from World War II, preaching what preaching, the Russia is a beast. It was not, it never was a beast. It just looked like something. It's wrote its history. God's son going to soon write the last paragraph in it too. So as World War II ends, and she starts to reconstruct, you can see this beast in Revelation 13 rising. And by the time, brothers and sisters, we get to the week of Daniel... Europe's reconstructed. She's a unified body of nations. She's got a unified European army. She's got absolutely a one world currency. And she's ready to fulfill her role. But since that period of time, <clears throat> we've got this other monster called United Nations, the New World Order. Theologians are, oh, it's the beast. It's a decoy. That's why these blind preachers preach things like that. Because in the 17th chapter, which pictures this Roman beast in here, the beast that was and is not and yet is. The United Nations never was a beast. It has its origin. The writing of the charter back here, 1948, it's set in motion. We pumped billions of dollars into that stinking thing for the last 50 years. It's never mattered to a dime. It's going to get in the way one of these days, and God says He will break it all to pieces in Ze Zechariah, the 13th chapter. I mean, the 12th chapter. It'll leave Europe alone. Now, the reason I'm going this route, <clears throat> we're moving toward a time frame. How many times have we heard doctors of divinity? Great. Teachers of prophecy, they tell you in great big words 
That's a Pope of Rome. The beast is going to make a covenant with Israel to build the temple. The Antichrist has nothing to do with the building of the temple. That's just a bunch of hocus pocus. With that thought in mind, <clears throat> I've even heard preachers way back here in time the rapture could take place any day. They do that to scare people, to bring converts. But if we will look at time in itself and how the Apostle Paul spoke of it. The Apostle Paul spoke of the rapture in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. He says, This we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Now, he couldn't go back here in the Old Testament and get scriptures to base it. He had a revelation that the Lord shall descend first with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Well, he writes that letter. It isn't long he begins to get questions coming back from the Thessalonian church. All about that. Because some of us believe it, why the Lord could come tomorrow. So the Apostle Paul writes the second letter, in which he explained it like this. Now concerning the coming of the Lord. Now when Paul said that, he's not even talking about the coming of the Lord over here, which is his visible, physical coming to earth to rule and reign. He's talking about the coming of the Lord in a mystical way. That means it will take place right here. Because in that second chapter it says, Concerning the coming of the Lord and our gathering together unto Him. Well, we know by His first letter we're going to meet Him in the air. But then in the second letter, He gives us a specific setting. That day will not come. Except, now except is conditional. There come a first a falling away. Well, goodness sakes, ever since World War II, if we look at the religious world, there has been a falling away. But that's not the falling away that Paul had in mind. When you look in the Aramic translation, It talks about that day shall not come except there be an open rebellion, which is an anti-God spirit hits society, which is completely contrary to all religions. And America as a nation that has been Christianized through the years gone by has been filled with these philosophers, psychiatrists, psychologists, educators, and we've even got young seminary students in the Presbyterian and even, say, in the echelons of Methodism that don't even believe in the virgin birth. They don't even believe that he rose from the dead. Well, I, I wonder why in the world did they even preach Christ? So open rebellion, brothers and sisters, is not a picture of the apostate church. It's a picture of society as God cuts his spirit off from conviction. Now I have to say, the very minute you begin to hear men say, let's get Christianity out of here, let's get the Bible out of our school, let's get prayers out of our school, you've got a social open rebellion sponsored by politicians and educators. <clears throat> now Jesus is coming soon. Because that kind of a spirit cannot be allowed to dominate this planet for the next 50 years. If it does, all religions will go into museums. So we're at the threshold at the coming of Christ. And I have to say, back here in 1963, there was a little man raised in this area, had a church over here about five miles. He was truly a, a prophet of God. The religious world was affected momentarily while he did live. 
They'd never seen a gift operate like that. But all his teachings was out of the pit of hell. Well, I'm sorry, Dr. So-and-so. <laughs> that might be what you say. But I sat there when he said it. And I never heard anything in my life that made any more sense. And that week he preached the revelation of six seals. What he said about the first seal, the second, the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth made more sense to me than anything I had ever heard from a doctor of divinity in my life. When it was done, we learned that four horse riders has already been riding through time. And we're living up here when that gray horse is coming on the scene. And he's spending his lives. Out of Rome comes a message. Beckoning Protestantism, come back home, that we all may be one. Pope John. And since that time, brothers and sisters, that gray horse has been a galloping at a high speed. The charismatic revival has hit the world. In Canada, Notre Dame, all over the world, <coughs> Catholic nuns and priests have ministered in youth meetings, supposed to be receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. No more revelation is in it, brothers and sisters, than nothing. So I have to say this morning, there's not a doctor of divinity from any of the organizations that wants to read Brother Branham's teachings on the six seals. I do. I learn it. <clears throat> I learned this much. I'll never forget the night that he was on the fifth seal. Some people from Chicago came down to my home. They were staying in the area to go to the meetings. I was asked a question sitting there in my living room, Brother Jackson. Do you think any Jews have been able to be saved down to time if they really didn't accept the Lord Jesus Christ? I just said no. But I went that night, <laughs> and here I am sitting right close there on the platform. And he come out there and he opened that up and began to read that fifth seal. And he saw them souls there under the altar crying out, How long, O Lord, holy and true? Dost thou not a, a judge and avenge our blood upon them? And before anything was said, white robes was brought by the angels of heaven. And they were all clothed in these white robes. And then it was said to these spirits, souls, rest a little while. Tell your fellow brethren, should be killed. No, rest a little season. Tell your fellow brethren, should be killed as you were. And Brother Branham says, that was what the Holy Ghost was all about. That was Jews that had died as the machine guns shattered, as they were forced into the gas chambers, then into the crematoriums, all over Poland and Eastern Europe, their bodies lay in trenches. And boy, I thought, that hit me between the eyes. <clears throat> I was wrong. And it said, a little season. Now, a little season from that time couldn't be any longer than a human generation which is 70 years. How many understand what I said? You add 70 years onto that, and it brings you over here, getting ready to start into this era. Because that shows, in that period of time, there's going to be some more Jews killed just like they were. And they're going to have white robes give to them. And they're going to come up out of this line the same as these under the fifth seal. They're all going to come up together. If we can't get these pictures in our mind straight, then we only absolutely, as we approach the week of Daniel, we've always got dragged questions. 
Like a little boy. He's got a half a dozen toys. You don't know which one to play with, but he's dragging them all. So that's our ideas. We're dragging them around. With this in mind, <clears throat> if we can get what's been going on, time, from here through here, where we begin to reach this, then it begins to help us to better understand how we go into this week of Daniel. Now let us back up from 1963. The message that man bought, brought has went around the world. It's been carried by every crow. Notice how I say it. Every cur dog. Brother Jackson, you ought to say that. There are men in America and Canada that's run all over the world preaching from quotations of books that don't know a bit more about what they're talking about than a dog. They're messengers of Satan to buffet the bride of Christ. Brother Jackson, if I was you, I'd be careful. Well, brothers and sisters, you read some of the churches in the book of Revelation that Jesus spoke to John. You've tried them that say they're apostles. You found them to be liars. Glory seekers. Self-made. Wouldn't work with nobody. God called me to preach. I've never seen a one. In the message that that man brought, there is a law of elimination. You either get it right, or the next step you take, you're going to step on something other that Satan's laid there. Because he knows you're carnal. He knows you're so full of enthusiasm you can't stand still. And so Satan shoots you with a revelation. And after a while, and I can look back through the years and name them. I have known some of them. Young men got a precious wife with four or five little children. Sat down in their living room. Prop their feet upon a stool. Wife, bring me a drink. Wife, shine my shoes. You lazy pup. What does he do? He gets a revelation from marriage and divorce. That the prophet allows him to have another wife. So he marries another younger woman. From another preacher in the message. This compounds the thing. You either get it right or you don't get it at all. But I have to say this morning, brothers, it's a joy to be a part of a family that men do know their calling and they can all begin to look at the same picture and want to work hand in hand. Just like that bunch of men up there in New York when the fall was over and the dust began to clear, whether it was black or white, they was in the rubbish trying to see if they could rescue some person that might be still breathing. They only got six. But they were working hand in hand for a same cause. None of them was working independently. For the last 35 years, <clears throat> that's all the world has had. Loud mouths. Quoters. And just in case some of the message people are tuned into the internet this morning, this might be as close as I could get to you. But I've said this before. You don't butter my bread, you don't sweeten my coffee, and you don't make me lose sleep at night. <clears throat> I get my stuff out of the book, and I remember what that man said. And I'll take what he said, 
where is it? It's a reference to a passage of Scripture. That's where you're going to hear me preach from. With these things in mind, the movement today as a whole can't even fathom where are we in time? Just how close are we? Because all in the back of their mind, Brother Branham's got to come back and finish it. You'll never see him this side of the resurrection. He's not coming back to please you and your little fantasies. <clears throat> you can preach that to more people that think like you. But the bride of Jesus Christ, as she journeys on, she's journeying on, brothers and sisters, and she's approaching an approximity right here. Over there, the countdown. That was put together by cause I had a dream back in 1933. I mean, back in 1993. The numbers that I heard spoken, the words that I heard spoken, when I was awake and I began to contemplate on these, God let me see a series of scriptures that began to unlock the picture. The first thing is, brothers and sisters, there's got to be a time frame for all of this to come about. The coming of the Lord is just not something other you just poke around at. It's not a hit and miss. The critics will say, well, no man knows the day or the hour. It says that in Matthew 24 four times. We're not talking about the day and our hour. We're talking about a year, year in proximity and a month. <clears throat> now let us start looking at this time frame. Because I'm just here for about 30 more minutes. We've got four scriptures. Let's get them in the right place. In 1967, I mean 68, in the month of October, when me and some other brothers was privileged to go to Israel for my first time, I wanted to talk with a rabbi. I pick it up where we're in his living room, and I said, Sir, can you explain to me any particular scriptures? I knew it would have to be all in the Old Testament. How the Jews, through time, have begun maybe to put together something that would give them hope, that would cause them to want to come back to the land that God had promised them. And if I remember, he said words like, he said, Gentlemen, do you know the book or the prophet of Hosea, I said, yes. He says, in the writings of Hosea, there is these words. How that the Jews, in that period of time, will begin to pray. They will begin to feel inspired. They will begin to feel like, even though they're dispersed from all over the world, that they're entering an era of time where they feel that God somehow or other is going to begin to grant, gather them back to the land of their heritage. They will some of them begin to pray like this. And he goes ahead and says, because the scripture says, after two days, he will revive us. Then he goes back to just a little bit before the turn of the 20th century. We're about in, we will say, 1800 and we will say 80 or 90. He said Jewish rabbis all over the world in the different communities, as they studied the prophets, they begin to get a feeling that it's time for them to start telling the people, we need to get a vision, we need to begin to plan how we're going to fulfill this by wanting and desiring to go back to the land of our fathers. He says that different conventions and gatherings of world Jewry in conventions, these rabbis began to give their speeches, and he says, gentlemen, many times they were booed and shut down. People weren't ready to hear it. 
But those that did, he said, out of that came the early followers and believers in this. It's, re it's referred to the rise of Zionism. They started out with, a, we will say, a biblical prophetic vision to want to go back to the land. But after a while, it became more political than really spiritual. But it was the beginning. So, brothers and sisters, now I bring it to the dream I had back in 1993. That was the number, number one scripture. So I'm asking you this morning, turn with me. <clears throat> We're going to get these scriptures that deal with the time frame. Because we're not just hocus pocus punching in the dark. We're in the sixth chapter. <clears throat> 780 years. Think of it. Way back here, 780 years before the advent of Christ. Way back here. That prophet is anointed. And it's like God gave him a great big powerful binoculars. He looks down through time. He looked beyond the scattering of the ten tribes which took place back here in 728 B.C. He looked beyond the scattering of the two tribes which was accomplished, we will say, in 600 B.C. He is looking at an era of time where there's two days that goes by. Them two days is not 2,000 years of calendar time. 2,000 years prophetic time. And notice, let's read, notice the wording. I'll read the whole thing. Come. And let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. That's been the picture of Judaism through the nations, the pilgrims that nations and societies have put out against them to persecute, to get rid of them. Then the second verse says, now let's notice the wording, after... Two days will he re notice it's a question. Will he revive us? In the third day, that's the millennium, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Now then, that prophecy pertains right here. We're getting ready to enter the week of Daniel. We know that when the revival does take place, there's only one place in time that it can happen. That's right here in the first part of the week. Now, let's look at this prophecy very seriously. We know from the book of Revelation where the reviving does take place. Because we see that in the seventh chapter. The reviving can't take place back here, nor over here. It's got to take place right here when the two prophets are on the scene. Now we have another scripture. When we come to Zechariah, the twelfth chapter, it tells us there, after Israel has this era of a miraculous war, fought right here just before the week starts. It says there that he will pour out his spirit upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. We know this. When the two prophets come on the scene, where will they do their preaching? Running all over the land? No. In the city of Jerusalem. In the streets of Jerusalem. So it's in the streets of Jerusalem they will prophesy that span of time. It's in Jerusalem that God will pour out His Spirit. And for three and a half years the people will come from the regions of the country to receive that benefit. Now then, 
Let's look at the two days. Here is a fixed point where it's fulfilled. But how do we know where it starts? If it's two days and the ending of it is here, you've got to have a starting point, don't you? That's the problem. So we take the 2,000 years prophetic time. When you put that into the number of days, then you take Roman calendar time and consider, brothers and sisters, from 33 A.D. to the year 2000 A.D., multiply that into your calendar time, that gives you the days there. When you begin to carry, compare the 2,000 years of prophetic time into the days compared to that, you will see that you have a carryover and that pushes this beginning to the year 2004 and a half. That's the span of time that them two days into calendar time, I mean into uh, prophetic time, transpires from here to there. Now then, the critic can say, now Brother Jackson, how do you know that's where it starts? But well, it's not even written. Then I ask you a question. Did not Jesus say these words? Heaven and earth shall not pass away till all these things shall be fulfilled. This generation shall not pass away till all these things shall be fulfilled. Now, if this is a prophetic point, then the beginning of it has got to be a historical point. Now then, the crucifixion of Christ was a historical point. So if it's not that, what's the next historical point? It's August the 10th, 69 A.D. The Romans hit Jerusalem, besiege the city, burn it, sack it, tear it to the ground. Thirty-six years later. So if you use that as your historical point... To begin the two, day, two, two days, 2,000 years, then you're going to move this week 36 more years forward. Where does that put the generation that saw all these world signs? I'll be dead. You will too. And all the Jews that remember the Holocaust that was children then, they'll be gone. This generation shall not pass away. So let's be sensible. We've got to pull it back here. That's the historical point. So if that's the historical point, then what's it all add up? 33 A.D., when Christ was crucified on April the 3rd, it fulfilled precisely the fulfillment of Daniel's weeks, 69 of them, 483 prophetic years. And he was crucified precisely on the last day of it. So the 2,000 years, the two days, is the span of time between the closing of the 69th week and the beginning of the 70th. That's biblical mathematics. You can't tell Nixon, you can't tell Bush, Colin Powell, and the rest of them. Let them play with their political ideas. They're going to wake up one of these morning with a bad case of indigestion and heartburn. And if they live with that very often, they're going to wind up with ulcerated stomach and cancer. <laughs> now then, let's look how precise and accuracy prophecies are. Hosea 6.2 After two days, will he revive us? We know the positive is yes. So then when we come to Zechariah 12, which shows that there's going to be a war, Israel will fight it. It's going to be a miracle war. It will not be fought in the week. It's going to be fought back here because there is no wars by Israel fought in the week. Now notice what I said. Israel fights no wars during this week of time. So we can say this, brothers and sisters. Hosea 6.2 brings you to this. 
Zechariah 12 brings a miracle war. Then the nation goes into here. The Jews from all the nations come to have it Jerusalem. Two prophets come on the scene and they begin to preach. And God begins to fill them with the Holy Ghost. Now let us look to Ezekiel 38 and 39. And it's absolutely funny to hear some of these doctors' divinity. They've had that war all over creation. They've jumped from here to there, from yon to back. But there's a few words in it. When will this war be easy to be fought? But Israel dwells safely. Well, I got sense enough to know, brothers and sisters, from here to there, they never have yet dwelt safely. They've had a Western power dominating and dictating to them like a little orphan boy. Especially the United States. With Israel then, <clears throat> when the time comes, when she fights this war of Zechariah 12, it's going to be so miraculous, as we were talking out there this morning. It's not going to last six months. It's not going to last even six weeks. Because it's going to be a war in which God fights in it. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to think I'm some crazy, dreaming fanatic. I've never asked God, I've got to have a dream, I've got to have this. I've spent months and times never having a dream about nothing. And then I'll, I'll come into another era. Here comes a dream every two months or so. But in that summer of 19 and 93, when I saw this, I could see precisely how Ezekiel fit right in the picture. There's got to be a miracle war. When that miracle war is fought, Israel will have so conquered the land from Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and Iraq, they will literally terrorize those inhabitants. When you take it to the prophecies of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they will hit the land of Edom and cut it off. And another prophecy says, in that day, God will render vengeance unto Edom, all because way back here, 600 and something other before the Babylonians came, through Obadiah, God saw how that Edomites would jump up and down with glee. And God's never forgotten it. Bush has. Nixon did. Colin Powell has. All the rest of them have forgotten it. We don't need this book. You will before you get out of here. With that in mind, when God does turn Israel loose, Israel will literally be on her own. own. And she will not need nobody's help. Because in Micah the seventh chapter, according to the days when he brought them out of Egypt, will again he show unto them great and marvelous things. Oh, you Christians are fanatics. You're a cult. Stick around, big shot. You come and see me three years from now. Let's see how you ask the question then. Later, brothers and sisters, when the spies Caleb and Jacob came in to Jericho that evening, and Rahab the harlot hit them. They ask her, what's the word among the inhabitants? What do they think about us? She said, when you crossed the Red Sea years ago, our hearts did melt within us. We were frightened. We were scared. Well, we've got them today. They, they don't believe nothing. So God's going to scare somebody. And so, brothers and sisters, when he turns Israel loose, young people, 
You like to sit up at night and watch the late shows and things. God's going to give you a show to watch 24 hours around the clock. In fact, some people are going to get so excited. Dinner's ready. I can't get away from watching that. Supper's ready. Mom, leave me alone. It's time to go to bed. I can't sleep when things are going like this. And young people, don't laugh. Yes, you will. Because it's going to be something that will magnify what happened up in New York two weeks ago. It's going to be war on the battlefield. Let me illustrate it. <clears throat> I'm not a fanatic. But two and a half years ago when I preached this subject, showdown at sundown. I used an old story that I read when I was about 14 years of age. I used to like to read a lot of these Wild West shows about the sheriffs and the outlaws and how they fought it out and everything. But this one was supposed to have been a true story. The fight at Old Cape Corral was over. Wyatt Earp was supposed to be traveling back towards Dodge City. In those days, the railroads had moved their, uh, their railroads to the end, which was Abilene, Texas, in western Texas. All the trail herds came out of Texas and in the far west into this great big shipping yards area. Abilene wasn't too large a place, with just a cow town. It was in the month of October when the trail herds would come in. The cattle buyers would be assembled, and the herds all had, as they arrived, embedded down out on the prairies. The story goes, as the managers came in and engaged the cattlemen, they would be given a number as to when they could bring their herds into the yards. But of a night, a lot of these cattle hounds would come into town and drink. And on this particular occasion, it was a known fact it was two brothers. And they made their names famous, Ben and Bill Johnson. They went down in history as two roughnecks. They were in town too. And the reason I tell this is because it's just like little Israel today. She's all by herself. A man by the name of White Earp come into town late one evening. He got a room in the hotel. Late in the evening, one of these Johnson brothers, I believe his name was, the one was Bill. He comes out of the saloon. About three buildings up, the sheriff is with an elderly man. He was sitting in a chair, asleep, pushed back against the building. You can just get the picture. And the sheriff just up and shot him. I mean, Johnson just up and shot him. Killed him right there. Well, all these other drunks, they begin to pile out into the streets. They got excited. And they begin to threaten the inhabitants of Abilene. Any time somebody would stick their head around a car, bang, there goes a bullet. So all night long, this bunch of ruffians roamed the streets, shooting in the air. Challenging people come out. White Earp was in the hotel looking out. The story picks up. He's down in the lobby the next morning when he comes downstairs. The little mayor has come through the back way into the lobby, talking to the proprietor of the hotel. The mayor was all shook up. The sheriff is dead. What are we going to do? We can't get nobody to be sheriff. That angry mob out there. The White Earp stood there and listened to him. And there's that Ben, the other brothers, out there in the street, cursing and carrying on. Directly, White Earp walked up to the mayor and says, Why don't somebody go out there and shut his mouth? The mayor was supposed to turn around and look at him and say, Well, who in the world are you? He just kind of softly says, Wyatt Earp. And the day is coming when the name Israel is going to be a shocker. 
that word Israel on politicians' lips is going to mean just as much as any brave man in the Old West that carried a star on his shirt. The mayor said, well, would you take the job? He says, I ain't got no gun. Well, I'll get you one. So he took him out the back door and down a few buildings and entered into the back door of a gun shop. He said, pick out what you want. He picked out a good war in old 44 and a holster. So they went out the back door and come into the back way of the hotel again. And the mayor pinned a, a badge on his white shirt. Wider walks over to the window and looked out on the street. And there's old Ben Johnson out there with a double barrel shotgun. Chanting, daring him to come out. Anybody. But Wyatt Earp watched his position. Israel studies your position. Where you're standing, who with, and are you alone? Directly, <laughs> <clears throat> he stepped into the doorway, and the sun shone bright on that white shirt, and that badge just shined. As he stepped into the street, he said, Ben Johnson, Dropped the gun and started walking toward him. Benson Johnson says to him, with curse words, who in the blankety blank are you? He says, I'm white or we don't want no problem with you. Dropped the gun and just kept walking toward him. Ben began to try to question it. Look, we don't want no problems. White Earp kept looking right at him, watching him stand. <clears throat> he walked right up, took the shotgun away from him, took him by the hand, led him back to the hotel. And with the mayor, took him and put him in jail. And the mayor then asked White Earp, weren't you afraid that he would kill you? No. Well, Why? He says, I watched how he was standing. I saw how he was holding the shotgun. For him to shot me, he would have had to change his position on the shotgun with his hand, left hand, and he would have to change the position how he was standing. He said, I would have killed him. That's supposed to be a true story. Didn't last long. <laughs> when you get the leader... The rest of the drunks settle, drunks settle down and go back to the herds. <clears throat> so that's what brothers and sisters is getting ready to happen one of these days. God's going to force a situation in the Middle East. That's a bunch of religious drunks over there. All on Islam. Are going to raise a ruckus. And little old Israel. A lone nation. They're going to come out of the, the hiding. <laughs> They're going to step out into the sunlight of time. It's the evening sunlight. Showdown at sundown. And there's going to be a conflict in the Middle East that's going to rock this world and shake it. Insomuch that the nation shall be confounded. They put their hands over their mouths. I don't understand this. Young people, this is one show you're not going to have to buy a ticket for. It's going to be free. And I just say, Lord, let me live long enough to see this thing happen. <clears throat> All right, my hour is up. But my, sign, my title on my subject is The Sign of His Coming. You've got to move in here in the right position to go through here to understand time so that when we do get over here, we'll know where we're at. Because all of this is written. The world of religion don't understand it. But Daniel 12 said, but the wise shall understand, but the wicked shall not. Heavenly Father, this morning, take these words and use them as you see fit. Bless the heart of your people. 
We realize, Lord, we're nothing. But God, I ask this morning, give us the wisdom, the insight, to know, Lord, how to embrace this. You paint the picture in our hearts, in our minds. May we be recipients, Lord, of the truth. And may we be found living and walking with you, Lord. Bless Israel today, Lord. Keep her under your protecting hand. Bless now my brothers and sisters. Throughout the remainder of the day, in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. My children, this morning as I've gathered thee once again, I look upon thee as a little flock of mine. And I've caused my word to become alive. It's the beginning of a picture that shall be painted over time. And I say to you, my little ones, if thou can open thy mind and thy heart, I will give to you a sure prophecy that you will know in this day and hour that thou art mine and I am thine, and together we will walk down this pathway to the end of it all. And I say to you, my children, great shall be thy joy, for thou shalt know in thy heart thou art a receiver of all the promises of God. Amen.